So what I want to use a little bit of time right now, maybe 10 minutes, is a little bit of a history lesson, um, or you know, going over some history that you might already know. How many here have heard the name uh, Galileo? Good. Uh, how many here heard the name um, Aristotle? OK, good. Uh, how many here have heard of a Copernicus? OK. Jared, what, who, uh, what is Copernicus known for? <laughs> okay, somebody who remembers what Copernicus was known for. Stephen? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, okay, um, I was going to. Co okay, then let me uh, ask for uh, three more names. Three more names. How many here have heard of uh, Ptolemy? How many? No one has heard of Ptolemy? It's a great name. What was Ptolemy known for? <laughs> okay. Um, how many here have heard of uh, uh, Tahiko Brahi? And uh, the third name was going to be Kepler. Okay. So, oh, okay. What have, where have you heard of Kepler from? <laughs> yeah. By the way, a lot of NASA stuff are named after these guys. There's a like there's a Kepler probe or something. Uh, so, anyways, you know. Um, so the reason I want you to go over this uh, um, history lesson, which is covered here, and expand it out a little bit more, is you have some sense of um, sort of history of science from having gone through school as a student in the 21st century or 20th century. Um, so, but I think a lot of people come away with an impression that's not 100% accurate. So I want you to, now that you are in, you know, calculus-based physics class, I want to make sure that your impression of the history of science is correct. So let me uh, ask you some simple question that I think most of you know the answer to. So that's the, this is the question behind the geocentrism versus the heliocentrism. So we are, you know, standing on Earth. Um, and you know you look out in the sky and you can see the sun. Um, so considering that sun and earth, which is at the center, or you know if you want to consider one of the two as not moving and the other one as moving, would you say that it's the earth that's uh, at the center, meaning earth is the one that's not moving, and it's the sun that moves, or would you say it's the sun that's uh, at the center, as in it's not moving, and it's the earth that moves? Like, what's the answer? Is it the sun at the center, heliocentrism, or is the earth at the center? Most of you will say it's the sun at the center. Uh, does that make intuitive sense to you, that does, it's the earth that does the moving? Does it feel like the earth is moving right now to you? No, <laughs> right? So, um, so, you know, why do you say then the sun is at the center? Diagrams. I can draw diagrams of Earth being at the center here. Uh, in fact, I, that's one of the diagrams I do have uh, loaded up. So if a diagram is the reason you believe it, then here, here's a diagram that shows Earth at the center. Yeah. So why don't you believe this diagram? Yeah. So. This is a scientific question. Um, is the Earth at the center, or is the Sun at the center, right? And for most of our written history, the proposition that made uh, most sense to people was the proposition that Earth is at the center. It, it actually takes a lot of modern science for you to actually agree that the sun is at the center. Instead of, you know, instead of just believing someone based on the authority of them telling you. Like most of you think the sun is at the center because that's what you've been told since a very young age. And if anybody ever said the earth was at the center, they were ridiculed out of existence. And I mean, you know, I don't mean to say heliocentrism is wrong. It's not wrong. But the attitude that you approach it with can be wrong. So what I want to first to show you is that geocentrism is a, was actually a scientific theory. It's not something that comes out of mysticism. It's not something that, I mean, there are religious things uh, associated with it. But the origin of geocentrism is the Greek philosophy. It's uh, the, you know, 
not the you know, modern science, but it's still scientific attitude that was at the basis of geocentrism. So, you know, when you look, so this is the diagram, you know, that shows Earth unmoving because that's our experience. We stand on Earth, and it doesn't look like Earth is moving. When you look at the sky, it does look like the sun and the moon, they do move. So you put them in an orbit around the Earth. So the sun goes around one Earth once a day, and moon, for whatever reason, moves much slower. It goes around the Earth uh, maybe once every 28 days, right? That's this, what this model says. And uh, the ancient astronomers, they found these things that they call the planets. Does anybody know the difference between planets and the planets like Venus, uh, Mars? Um, difference between planets and the stars, these stars. Like if you were an astronomer just looking at the night sky without any telescope, just looking at it with the naked eye, um, does, does anyone here know what the difference would be? So there's the twinkling. When you look at the stars, they twinkle as in, uh, when you look straight at it, you're not blinking. The starlight would go like um, out and in for some reason. And the planets, all right, they don't twinkle as much. But even the stars, sometimes they won't really twinkle. It's a matter of uh, atmospheric condition. They're only, they're only visible certain times of the year. Uh, stars? No, planets. I see. Um, so. So planets, they don't match the seasons exactly. Um, so, but it, it does have something to do with stars. They are um, unchanging. When you look at the night sky, you will always see the same pattern of stars. The, the patterns that's visible at any given time of the year might change. So this, we are in the winter right now. So when you walk out at 10 p.m., after your lab today, um, or 9 p.m., then uh, in the sky, what you will see uh, most prominently is the constellation called Orion. Um, it, Orion looks like this. Uh, Orion's belt and two stars like this. Like It's a, a big pattern that you will notice. Once you notice these three stars in a line, you will see that all the time, every time it's winter. Um, and you know, in the spring and summer, you will see different set of constellations. But that's what ancient astronomers imagined, that the stars are a pattern of light that's embedded into this uh, celestial sphere. And the celestial sphere rotates around the Earth once every, um, once every day. And this uh, background of stars do not change. Okay? And what distinguishes planets is that their positions change, that when you so you know you can imagine yourself as ancient shepherd or whatever. At night, you have to watch the ship. You have nothing else to do, so you look at the stars. You start to notice these patterns, uh, like the notice the patterns like this. Name them Orion. Attach them to some mythology about a hunter. <laughs> and um, once you start to recognize these patterns, then what you will see is that every now and then you see a, a spot of light that doesn't belong in this pattern. And if you keep watching them day over day, you notice that those lights, they move across this pattern. And that's what uh, people named as planets. So these are uh, called planets. And it comes from the uh, Greek word. It, um, I forget the exact origin word, but the English translation would be wanderer because they, they move through the sky um, over a very long period of time. So for example, if you look at position of Mars, uh, to, uh, for it to go through the one full cycle, it would take about two years. Um, so, it's a, so it's not exactly seasonal, but if it, when you look at the night sky day after day for over a month of time, you would start to notice that these don't appear at the same position each night. So, so you know, uh, the great the Greeks had a long time to think about this, and they came up with a, a, what we would today call scientific theory. They came up with a hypothesis that this is the model that explains why some of the light you see in the sky moves. You call them planets. Um, they move because they are, they are on their own orbit. And how fast their orbit goes, 
uh, is different from how fast this orbit of the, the celestial sphere goes. Yeah? And so I'm, so this is something that would, this would be covered in an astronomy class over a day or two days. Um, like Astro 10, this, they would spend a day or two covering this. I'm just trying to go through this quickly. Um, there's a couple things that's odd about the motion of this planet. So I'm just gonna make up a figure. Um, I'm pretty sure Orion is not in this, uh, the uh, path of planet, so um, don't judge me for doing this, but I'll just uh, pretend that Mars is at one position at a particular light. Once again, I'm not claiming that this is anything you'd see on a real night nice sky. In fact, I'm pretty sure you won't see this, but just imagine that Orion, this is uh, one of the constellations that's in the actual path of Mars. So over a period of a month or so, what you would see is this Mars uh, appearing at different positions um, over a period of month or so, or a long enough period of time. And all of this so far matches with the model that we have built, right? You say, all right, so Earth is at the center and the Mars moves at some particular rate and the rate at which the stars move the sphere containing the stars rotate is different from rate at which the, the circle that the Mars is on moves. That's why there's a, the alignment between them changes over a length of time. Now, here's the strange thing that ancient astronomers would know this because they are good at observing details. They would know this after a while. They would know this that this motion of planet, at some point they would slow down. And for some brief period of time, maybe about a month or two months at a time, they would actually go backward for a bit. So it was moving this way initially. And over some period of time, it would go backward. And then at some point later, it would resume the forward motion. This is given a name. In case you are interested in looking it up, uh, it's called retrograde motion. Retrograde. Uh, motion. It's called retrograde for the same reason that if a, a fashion is retro, it's like backward. <laughs> so if this is the normal forward motion, then this is a backward motion. And you know this motion is puzzling to this um, the early initial geocentric model, as in you can't really explain it based on here. So if you are sticking with this model, then um, what Edward said would uh, work. There's some motion of the planet that you simply cannot, that the, there's a motion of the planet here that you simply cannot explain with this, uh, this geocentric model. Now, uh, what I will tell you is that, so all of this were noticed by Greek philosophers 2,000 years ago, actually more than 2,000 years ago. Um, like 2,500 years ago. So you know, this is not new to anybody who's actually observing the night sky. So they came up with a solution that's uh, still intuitive to them. This is where Ptolemy comes in. So, um, so I gave you, some, I threw out some names. Let me write them down here and uh, I'll explain. Um, so the names I threw out were Aristotle. I'll try to write them down in, um, uh, chronological order. Aristotle, Ptolemy, and then later on you would find uh, Copernicus, and Galileo is the famous name that most people know. Um, and but the the people that I really want to bring your attention to in a few minutes is actually Tycho Brahe and. I may be misspelling some name. Um, Joha, yes, this is the name I think I'm misspelling. Mm. Uh, Kepler is the name that I probably won't misspell. This is the important name. And so let me just write down a brief description of what each of these are known for. Aristotle is actually known for a lot of things. Uh, if you ever take a philosophy class, you will hear a lot about him and you know, a lot of things we still think about in philosophy still comes in from Aristotle. He was like student of Plato, was student of Socrates. Um, in physics class, he's almost always a butt of a joke. 
because almost nothing he said about physics is correct. <laughs> nothing he said about motion is correct. Nothing he said about astronomy ends up being correct. But you know, he's the one who proposed, who's credited with the geocentric model. So we will credit him with the initial geocentric model, which um, fits our intuition well. And you know, that's I think why um, Aristotle is kind of a part of a joke in physics class because a lot of things he says fit our intuition. So when he th uh, says something about philosophy or I don't know, writing, poetry, uh, things where you rely on your intuition, what he says makes a lot of sense and it's valid for a long period of time. But a lot of things in physics actually don't make sense. It doesn't make intuitive sense. That's why we have to spend so much time trying to develop your intuition. And that's the same reason why this is a great Greek philosopher. Not a dumb guy, he's a smart guy, but he was almost wrong about almost anything he said about physics. Because he was relying on his intuition alone, and he didn't have all the empirical data or the mathematical tools that we take for granted today. So Ptolemy is the one who actually improved this scientific model of geocentrism. So um, he, he came up with a model that accounted for this retrograde motion. So if you are looking for something to just look up, uh, what you can look up is the phrase, epicycles. I think I have a picture of an epicycle somewhere here. Uh, yeah, so this is an illustration of an epicycle. So uh, let me erase this board so that you can see it better. Uh, it's not any bigger, okay. Um, so. This is an illustration of an epicycle. Um, so the epicycle means just uh, on the circle. So what, he, what Ptolemy did was he put another circle on top of the circular motion of the Mars. So imagine this red circle is Mars. Then in the original geocentric model, Earth is why is Earth not at the center? Well, let's say Earth is at the center, and Mars, uh, which is on a circle that's going around the, uh, which is on a circle going around the Earth, there's another circle on top of that. And the, so according to the Ptolemy's model, how we see Mars is a result of the rotation of these two circles. Then you can imagine how, depending on their relative uh, motion, as there will be at some point along this motion, this Mars would appear to be moving backward. If it, when Mars is, let's say, on this portion, so let's uh, you know, imagine that this circle rotates this way, and this circle also rotates this way, then when Mars is on this portion of its motion on the epicycle, then these two can combine in a way that it generates this backward motion. So this problem of retrograde motion was solved by using the, uh, this model uh, called epicycle. And this model has been actually in use for thousands, well, more than a thousand years. Uh, Ptolemy came up with it, I don't know, sometime uh, BC, sometime more than 2,000 years ago. And it wasn't until uh, around the 1500s when this was getting challenged. And I guess the whole, um, story of wh why this uh, started getting challenged is a little bit of a too long story to go through. Comes down to um, um, over that long period of time, thousand years, they had to keep modifying the model to make it continue to agree. Um, it, so they had to keep adding epicycles upon epicycles. And you, if you're into history of science at all, that phrase, uh, epicycles on epicycle, epicycles, I guess upon or on epicycle, it's um, it's a sort of um, commentary on complexity of a model that you are building, and this actually happens in modern science. Um, the greatest achievement in modern science is something called the standard model, standard model of particles. And um, if you talk to any particle physicist. Uh, what they will tell you is that uh, they know for a fact that standard model is not the final correct model, even though that's our greatest achievement of the 20th century. And one of the reasons is that it has too many epicycles. The standard model has like 15 or 17 adjustable parameters. Um, there's too many 
um, uh, gears in the model that has to fit just right. And you know, when we look at attitude, our attitude today is that when something gets that complicated, our intuition says, okay, that cannot be right. There has to be a better way of explaining this. And that's the, sort of the same thing that was happening uh, like, I don't know, 500 years ago, that astronomers had been working with this theory, this framework for a long time, but they were having to add more and more complication to make it continue to work. And at some point, somebody said, all right, this isn't working, we need a new model, you need a new paradigm. And um, th I guess there are different people who uh, were proposing this. Actually, there was another guy earlier in the Greek um, era when, um, I forget his name, I really forget his name. But the idea that the Earth is not at the center, but the Sun is at the center, it's not a new idea, it's actually a very old idea. Uh, Copernicus uh, is only responsible for bringing it back during Renaissance, right? So he was bringing back the old classical ideas that has, had gone um, out of, had fallen out of favor. So this is the Copernicus's uh, geocentric model, uh, Copernican whatever. Uh, wait, that's the Ptolemic system, I want this. This is the Copernicus's, uh, not geocentric, heliocentric model. Oops, um, there it is. Um, so all the writings are on the top half, so I'll show the top half. Um, it's, I think, in Latin, but everyone has some sense of what each of those words mean. Sol, S-O-L. Like everyone here has, like solar, um, Greek, I mean, sorry, Latin rule for sun. And here's the Mercury, Venus, Earth on the third circle. Um, um, wait, what's on the fourth circle? I have no idea. Um, um, well, here is Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Um, here are the stars that's uh, uh, way out far away. So, so this is the uh, Copernican model. And so he's the one that we usually credit with the heliocentric model of the heliocentric model of the solar system. Um, um, even though you know it wasn't a new idea, but he's the one who brought it back after people have forgotten about it for a thousand years. Now let me ask you this question: Was Copernicus right? As in, you take this model and you just apply it to our solar system, you know, make some observations. And in fact, you know, this is a hard part in astronomy. You have to sort of uh, imagine up this model, the three-dimensional model of where the Sun, Earth, and Mars are in the actual space from limited information we can get from our night sky. So it's something that actually takes a lot of math. It takes a lot of geometry to figure all this out. But, you know, imagine that you did that. You put the Sun at the center, put Mercury after some observations, put it on some circle of some radius, moving, moving at some speed. And you do that for Venus, Earth, Mars. Let's say you do all that, you make your observation for a, you know, a few years. And so this is what I mean when I ask the question, is this model right? As in, you make all those observations and you would find, oh, all the planets are where they are supposed to be. So here, you know, let's say after having observed Mars move this way, you might predict two months later, Mars is going to be here. And um, the question, question of if a model is right is answering that question. If you make a prediction, is, will you find that that prediction is confirmed by actual measurement? Anybody here know enough about the Copernican heliocentric model to answer this question? Because I sense that a lot of people want to say yes, but you suspect the answer will be no. So that's why you're not saying yes, right? <laughs> yeah, so the answer is no. Copernican model was actually wrong. In fact, here's the one biggest uh, way you can judge if it was wrong or correct. Do you know from your knowledge of history if a Copernican heliocentric model was immediately accepted? No, you do know that there was a whole big debate over it, right? There were people getting burned at the stake. There were people being forced to recant Galileo. People being forced to recant whatever it is they wrote. Um, so there was a big debate. Why do you think there was a debate? Religion. 
So there are some um, issues having to do with the uh, essentially politics of the time. Uh, people in power didn't want their power challenged. And in that time, that's what religion uh, reflected, Pope and whatever. So all this actually comes with uh, the whole um, the, the Reformation movement, but whatever. So I want to stay outside of that. So there are people in power who had invested in geocentric model already, and they were resistant to change. But actually, when I talk about debate, um, so there's the, the debate that you hear about in the history class, and you know that's not wrong, but the impression sometimes you get from your, your history class is that that was the only debate. That if the you know, Catholic Church didn't exist, then uh, Copernican idea would have been immediately accepted, and that's not true. There was a debate within the scientific community. So among the group of astronomers, people who have no particular religious conviction whether it has to be one or the other, not everyone was convinced that this was correct. And it really comes down to measurement. So you make this prediction, right? So you, you observe Mars, let's say, at this position at a particular time that you observe it. And you have built a model of motion of Mars, so you make a prediction. Next month, it's the same day, Mars will be here, for example. And Let's say, I, I'm just make, gonna make up some positions. So let's say this, is the, this purple is the prediction based on geocentric model. And let's say the uh, Copernican heliocentric model makes a different prediction. Um, Copernican heliocentric model makes the prediction, let me erase all these. It makes the prediction that um, the Mars will be here. This is the Copernican model. Uh, so I guess let, I should say helio. And when people measure the position of the Mars, it would, you know, a month later, it would be somewhere like here. So as in both the models were wrong. Like we knew that geocentric model was wrong in the sense that people have been adding epicycles and trying to predict the motion of Mars. It works well, but not perfectly. There's, uh, there's has always been this uh, measurement error. And with the model that Copernicus proposed, it wasn't any better, at least not initially. It also had errors. Copernican heliocentric model would also predict the position slightly off, the same way the Ptolemy's model did. So that's the source of the debate among astronomers, that, um, that, that you know, this heliocentric model, it wasn't any more accurate, at least not initially. Um, than the old model that's been already around. And really, when you, um, when you look at the sort of, look at the history, heliocentric model, it has, uh, I can cite one pro and one con. Like uh, one thing that you would say uh, in favor of the model, and one thing that you would say against the model. Any idea what the number one thing you would say against the heliocentric model? Like if somebody told you, showed you this diagram, that tell you that the sun is at the center of uh, your visible universe, and that Earth is the one. Earth moves around the sun. What would you say to that? Like, what would be the number one reason you would bring up saying and say, "I don't believe you"? It doesn't feel like we're moving. Yeah, it doesn't feel like we are moving, right? I mean, so. For you guys, you know about Newton's first and second law. You know that a world can be moving just at constant speed. And there, in terms of what, of what you're feeling, there wouldn't be any difference. But you know, we are talking about people before Newton's time. They don't know about Newton's laws. But the number one big thing is that heliocentric is, uh, it's not intuitive. It's uh, not intuitive in the sense that um, Earth doesn't feel like it's moving. So it doesn't. Um, it, doesn't feel like Earth is moving. And there are other arguments brought up against a uh, heliocentric model. And actually, Galileo was the one that answered a lot of them. Um, so Galileo is the one who discovered the moons of uh, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. We, I think Jupiter and Saturn, or just Jupiter? I don't know. We call them Galilean moons because Galileo is the one who used the telescope to find them. And that addressed some of the arguments against this model. 
because what people were saying was, you know, you have this uh, moon going around the Earth. So what people were saying was, doesn't, as the Earth moves, doesn't it mo leave the moon behind? What's keeping the moon with the Earth? And uh, when you know Galileo saw the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, that's when oh, it apparently happens with the other planets too. So why couldn't it happen with the Earth? Um, but you know, this would be the biggest uh, reason that some of them would say this cannot be right because it, it's not intuitive. It doesn't immediately agree with your gut feeling of how things work. And so let's say that's the con. The biggest thing that has, um, that you have going for the heliocentric model and the reason a lot of the astronomers switch it to this position, even though heliocentric model was not any more accurate, was this was more elegant. It's an easier way of calculating the positions of planets. In fact, that's how Copernicus put it. I guess he was afraid of getting persecuted by the church. So um, he did publish it after, like posthumously after he died. And he uh, couched his proposition very carefully, as in uh, he didn't say, this is actually how things are. He said, well, if you think of things as being like this, then it makes it easier for us to calculate the positions of planets. Um, but the, that would be the biggest pro. That is, uh, it is more elegant. Elegant or a simpler calculation. So you know, imagine you are an astronomer, and you are looking at two models. They are both uh, equally wrong or equally right, as in they predict the position approximately, but they don't do it precisely. And you are trying to pick between them. That to, this is the old model that everyone has been using, but it's been very complicated. It, um, to do any calculation with this, you had to draw a lot of epicycles and do that. And uh, I think at some point, there's like two or three levels of epicycles. And, um, uh, you might have gotten frustrated with, the, with all that level of complexity. Then you look at this model, it looks a lot simpler. And with a simpler model, if you get about the same level of accuracy, then you might say, oh, maybe this is actually closer to the correct model than the geocentric model ever will be. Yeah. So this was the scientific debate of the time. And that's how I want you to present this debate. The debate between geocentric model and heliocentric model, it's not a, I mean, at least it should not be a debate between religion and science. I think that's historically incorrect. It's, a, it's not a debate between religion and science. It's a debate between two competing scientific models. As in, geocentric model was scientific in the sense we would call it. And heliocentric model was also scientific. And one thing I want to tell you is that they're both wrong. In terms of um, saying what the exact picture of the um, solar system as they are, they are both wrong. As in, if you are doing it, if you are a modern astronomer, you would definitely not use a geocentric model. You, you wouldn't call yourself an astronomer if you're doing that. And you also would not use the same assumptions that Copernicus did in building his model 